Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I have one o'clock, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to our breakout panel, Encouraging Student Participation in the Flex at Pitt Environment. Uh, we think it's a very important and timely topic. Uh, my name is John Radzilowicz, and I'm a manager and teaching consultant at the Teaching Center here at Pitt, and it's my privilege to be the moderator for this session. Now, we have three distinguished panelists with us today, and we are very grateful for their participation. Uh, in a moment, I'm going to introduce all of them, uh, and then they will each speak one at a time for about 10 minutes about their practices and experiences. And after they have all concluded their presentations, we'll open the floor for questions and discussions. So you'll see we're leaving a lot of time for that engagement as well, right? Um, please use the chat feature to ask your questions. And I will suggest that you can type them in at any time. So feel free to be typing questions as each person makes their presentation. And then that way we'll have questions loaded up and ready to go once everybody is finished. So with that, let me introduce our panelists. First, we have Loretta Fernandez. Dr. Fernandez is a visiting assistant professor in the Department of Teaching, Learning and Leading in the School of Education here at Pitt. And she specializes in foreign language pedagogy, sociocultural theory, systemic functional linguistics, and qualitative research methods. Joining us also is Katrina Barto Jacobs. Dr. Jacobs is an assistant professor of practice of language, literacy, and culture, also with the Department of Teaching, Learning, and Leading at the School of Ed. Her research centers on the integration of sociocultural perspectives of literacy and practitioner research within teacher education programs and in early childhood educational contexts. And finally, we have Laura Stam. Dr. Stam is currently an instructor in the Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies program in the Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences. She completed her PhD in Film and Media Studies here at Pitt. And she has taught courses in Composition, Film and Media Studies, and in GSWS. Her research interest includes AIDS crisis media, queer film festivals, transgender studies, and feminist theory. Her book titled The Queer Biopic is forthcoming with Oxford University Press. Again, thank you all for joining us today, panelists. And we are going to begin with Dr. Fernandez. So Loretta, I will turn it to you. Thank you, John, and hello everybody, and thank you for having me here. Today I'm going to talk about two aspects that influenced and I would say improve my teaching using the flex at pit model. For all of us, this has been a very challenging period. For example, how to make your classes interactive in Zoom or how to find tools and teaching strategies that are flexible, how to encourage group work for the co-construction of learning and how to make sure that students are able to manage the stress of passing from synchronous to asynchronous modes of working, how to make them part of a community of learning. So during this discussion, I will, I will focus on two of these challenges, the group work and the synchronous asynchronous modes of working. Uh, the first uh, topic I want to talk is uh, regards group work. And I am going to introduce this from a synchronous perspective. So consider that this situation puts challenges for us teachers, but it puts also challenges for, for the students. So for the students, it's sometimes very difficult to meet because being in this situation in which they cannot meet in person, they have different commitments, study, work, family, uh, uh, that the schedules are completely different. And so, uh, sometimes they have these uh, difficulties in, in trying to find a good place and a good moment for group work. They also have what we call Zoom burnout. So they are exhausted and sometimes they are not willing to assist to other Zoom meetings. Moreover, with the uh, working group, there is also another important risk, which is the uneven distribution of workload uh, for the students. So many times one student just take the whole workload 
does the presentation or those whatever project just to finish with uh, the assignment and get the grade and other students just don't participate to that. So uh, for uh, to do that, I decided to use the Zoom breakout rooms. Uh, in my synchronous classes, I usually left about 30 minutes uh, at the end of the lesson in which the students were worked uh, in groups for a final project that was going to be presented during the end of the semester. I gave the project in a whole classroom setting, and then I divided the project in different parts. Each part will be uh, um, done every week. Finally, I assign the students to the breakout rooms. You know that the, in the breakout rooms, Zoom can assign them randomly or you can assign them. So I knew which were the groups and I assigned them to that. And they work around 10 to 15 minutes, depending on the on which part of the project they were working. And I assign them roles. So one of the students would be the group leader this week. One of the students will take notes this week. One of the students will present at the end of the breakout room in a whole classroom setting to the other groups in order to receive feedback, uh, peer feedback. Uh, so in this, in this way, the students created little by little the project. They didn't have to meet in other times. And I was able to go from room to room and give them immediate feedback, which I think it's very important also for the uh, assessment of the students to see how the, the group work proceed. Moreover, at the end of the project, I assigned them a whole grade from the presentation, and this was a group grade, and I asked them to write a reflection of how their work was how their group work was in this uh, project so that they could get also an individual grade according to the work they had. Now, in a synchronous uh, mode, I had a real big problem with oral communication. So how to help students talk to each other, see their gestures, their faces, the way in which, you know, Sometimes we use facial expressions to complete the oral thoughts. Uh, and to do this in an asynchronous way, I was advised by the Center of Teaching and Learning and also by the expert of the School of Education to use a tool called Flipgrid. So Flipgrid is completely integrated with Canvas. And that was very easy because you can use, for example, the, split, the speed uh, grader with flip grids. Uh, moreover, since I have many international students and some of them were not able to come to Pittsburgh to attend classes because they were doing all, all, all online classes, students can record whenever they want their posts and they can also receive feedback on their posts. So they have like this idea of interacting with other people. Uh, moreover, for the international students, there is also the development of the oral communication skills. But for any student, for example, if you are that kind of student that don't want to talk in a whole classroom setting, Using Flipgrid, you can prepare actually your discourse, you can record, and if you don't like it, you just push a button and you, uh, uh, delete it and you can also uh, have different responses from different people so not only from the teacher and the teacher can answer online so with a video but can answer also in written mode so it's it it gives you a lot of flexibility and a, and a lot of opportunities to talk so i uh, just try to develop these two points of our uh, of my work with the uh, flex at fit model. And I would like to conclude saying that uh, it is daunting sometimes, it has been daunting to try to build connection between the students, particularly in this period and working online. But uh, we have to be also mindful of the complication that the students meet and save time in our classes to give them the possibility to communicate is something extremely important to build that classroom atmosphere, that classroom uh, 
team and group that could really generate more learning. So interacting with their classmates, students, how to live better the learning experience. We give that opportunity also to our international students or to students that are not in, at this moment in Pittsburgh. And uh, we have the, uh, also us the possibility to see them, to see their reaction to what we are talking about, which is something extremely important from the teacher point of view. The important part of working in this way is that knowing that the teacher is the one that says, sets the tone of the conversation. So if you ask the student to interact in a formal way, they will be more formal. If you ask them to interact in an informal way, they will be more informal. So you have to tell them what you expect for them. So they, they, they don't feel stressed out about having to post something online. It is also important that we establish clear goals and Dividing the work, giving them the opportunity to have different responsibilities, help them also to be more accountable of their work they are making in the classroom. So I think that it's for us, it's important to make our classroom a space in which the students feel safe and feel able to share class related math materials, but also materials that are not class related, sometimes just to talk by those 30 seconds, one minute about what is happening, how things are happening is just really important for them, but it's really important for us as teachers too. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Loretta. Let's go to Dr. Stam. Um, so I'm gonna bring up a PowerPoint. Hopefully everything works well with that. If not, um, give me a shout and I'll try to fix it. So working on encouraging student participation, I am going to pick up on some of the ideas that Loretta presented and then add kind of my own perspective to them. So first of all, I wanted to foreground my general teaching philosophies and methods for encouraging student participation. And my biggest goal is to get students to take ownership of the class material. So they feel like it's something that is accessible to them. It's something that they're invested in. And there's a sort of buy-in um, philosophy to my teaching where I want students to recognize that it's something valuable to them and something that they're actually interested in so that um, they actually work harder at it. Uh, responsibility for class learning. Similarly, um, I let my students know at the beginning of the semester that I am here to provide resources, facilitate their learning, curate the materials, but at the end of the day, it's just as much their responsibility to be a part of the course learning as it is mine. Um, connected to that, engaging individual student interests to build expertise in certain subjects. Uh, because teaching GSWS is so often interdisciplinary and students come to the courses for lots of different reasons, I like to try to engage their own personal interests and allow them to hone in on those interests and build expertise that they can then share with the class. So the uh, assignment that I'll be presenting on today is the student article and presentation and discussion lead. And this is an assignment I've used in a variety of contexts and classes. And I'll talk about that in the next few slides. Uh, for this assignment, I scaffold it so that students are prepared to do the assignment when it comes up. Um, as Loretta mentioned about the teacher setting the tone for the class, I like to have students not do their presentation until the fourth week of class approximately, so that I've had time to model the type of pedagogy I want to see from them. So again, scaffolding seminar style discussion throughout class so that when students are tasked with leading discussion, it's not something new to them. They've already been talking in class and familiar with the sort of ping-ponging off of each other that I try to facilitate. The discussion lead also serves as a preparatory task for the final project, which in the class that I'll be talking about is a paper and presentation. So 
At the end of the semester, they deliver an informal presentation on their final project. So the discussion lead gets them already comfortable with talking to the class and sharing their ideas. So then when they have to do that at the end of the semester, it's not some sudden shock to them. Um, synchronous versus asynchronous. Uh, my teaching philosophy is the same, just different methods. And I'll try to share those different methods um, at the end of the presentation. Uh, so the course I'll be talking about is Introduction to Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies. It is typically 19 students. It's a W course, meaning they have to produce a lot of writing. Students are working on oral communication alongside written communication. Um, it's diversity of student backgrounds and interests, as I mentioned before. Uh, my class is usually 75 minutes long, and it is structured around a flipped classroom design. So students come prepared to talk about the materials, and the classroom learning is primarily through discussion and their participation in the class. Um, so the assignment, as I have it here, is designed for a synchronous class. Um, directly from my syllabus, it reads, you will be asked to lead discussion for one of the assigned readings with an approximately 10-minute in-class presentation. This presentation should identify and explain the key terms and concepts the article uses, along with concerns, issues and concerns that it raises. Your presentation should include key points, biographical information about the author, and at least three discussion questions that jumpstart the discussion of the article. A visual aid is required. So typically, I ask students to use a PowerPoint or any other sort of visual aid that they want um, so that students are more easily able to follow along. Um, in terms of how the articles are assigned, students are um, tasked with picking one that aligns with their interests. So there's a Google Doc that I circulate during the first week of class, and they are asked to sign up for the reading that they would like to present on. So again, it's that whole idea of taking ownership where they picked the reading that they're presenting on. Uh, I didn't just assign it to them. Rather, they have some say in what they're presenting on, so I expect that they'll have a little bit more investment. The assignment itself, what I like about it, um, it encourages a diversity of voices and perspectives in the classroom, so it's not just me always talking at them or me asking the questions, but rather students um, responsible for lecturing material, as well as um, asking questions of their fellow classmates. Um, I also encourage students to bring their own perspectives into the classroom. For instance, my current class, I have a student who is training to become a surgeon for gender reassignment surgeries. And so she's presenting um, during our Transgender Studies Week and going to be talking about um, her experience as shadowing a physician who does this work. Um, structure and conversation between students. I think so often as teachers, we want to get our students to talk with each other versus just at us. And this provides a structured way of doing that. And this also allows me to gauge student comprehension of key concepts. So, for instance, if a student is presenting on something like intersectionality and they're really struggling with presenting it to the class, I'll know that this is a topic that they might be a little iffy on and it's something that I need to hit harder in classroom discussions that I lead or I might need to do a mini lecture on it. Um, I also like to encourage student creativity in this assignment insofar as allowing them to take the reins with how they want to present the material. Um, how I evaluate it, I use a holistic rubric, which is right there. Um, I upload it to Canvas with the assignment at the beginning of the semester so that the expectations are clear. And I'm allowed, able, able to provide narrative feedback in the comments and suggestions if I have them. And honestly, using a rubric has saved me a lot of headache in terms of how I grade this. The expectations are clear from the start of the semester. And generally speaking, most of my students end up getting a 14 or 15. Like, very often they do a great job. Uh, so asynchronous options and other modifications. 
So one of the ways that I've done this as an asynchronous course before is to have students record a video presentation. Uh, they can use the audio recording feature on Canvas or some other sort of video recording that works better for them. Um, and then the discussion can happen in the discussion board on Canvas. I've also had students do a Canvas discussion board lead where they put all of their key information at the top of the Canvas discussion board um, and upload the key concepts, application, uh, video images, or other media that they want to share with the class, and then present their discussion questions that students um, discuss in the discussion board um, below that. Um, I've also had students do it as a group discussion lead. So if you're working with a larger class, you can have them do the Canvas discussion board lead as a group. Um, if you're working with a bigger synchronous class, you can also have them do synchronous discussion leads. Um, you can also have them do sort of sequential discussion leads. So say you're working with a really large class and you don't want to have them um, feel the onus of working outside of the classroom. You can have one student do the introduction, one student do an application, one student do the discussion questions and kind of ping pong off of each other um, to set up the discussion for the rest of the class. That is all I have for you. Good, and oops, did my share stop or is it still going? No, you're good. Thank you okay, very good. much. Okay, good. And again, uh, don't worry about the pop. We've all been there. <laughs> okay, yes, um, we're going to switch gears and give Dr. Jacobs a chance again. I think we've got her back and set to go. I think so. Is it working? Yes, we hear you. Oh, terrific. terrific. I am so sorry, everyone. I feel we are living one of my first comments, which was um, flexibility within a, a system is has really been key uh, for me. Um, so my work is primarily with people who are um, teacher education candidates, which means that they are in every possible experience you can imagine right now. They are in their own work, either full-time in-person K through 12 schooling, fully remote K through 12 schooling, or many, many of them are in a hybrid uh, model situation. And because of that, for health reasons and safety reasons, we decided we needed to run all of our classes remotely. So we really leaned in to the um, digitally uh, uh, worked um, aspects of the Flexit PIT model. We kind of knew ahead of time that was something we were going to need to do. And so the other challenge I faced was my classes were the once a week long seminars. So it would have been a two and a half hour time after many of my student teachers had already been online um, for most of the school day. So I really stopped and thought about what were my goals as an instructor and thought about where was I trying to present information that they needed for their methods courses and where was I trying to engage in classroom discussion, um, project work or hands-on things and um, those aspects. And so for that reason, the model I chose to do was I would create um, about an hour of content that was asynchronous every week. I would create a PowerPoint slide that I would then do a screen capture. I used an uh, iPad to do a screen capture of myself recording over the slide so they could hear me talking through it. I would record the lecture. Um, I have an Apple Pencil that I would use to annotate the slides, which they all really expressed enjoying. It really made it much more lively for them. And I really tried to go through and think about what is the core kind of uh, direct to student content that I need to give this week. That meant that when we had come together, that PowerPoint, that lecture had become a shared text for the class. Um, so I always started with who has questions on any of the content? Was there anything that confused you? Um, there was an open discussion board always for general questions. And some weeks, if we were dealing with a particularly complex topic, I might ask them ahead of time to log on and uh, give me their understanding in a very brief way. What that allowed for was less time sitting in front of the camera together, um, but also really a chance to then use that time in ways that were meaningful and productive 
towards that more hands-on or interactional learning that was happening. Um, and then within our time together, I would really structure it. I would have the same, um, this sounds like a silly little thing, but my students really appreciated that each week I used a different theme in PowerPoint so they could connect that asynchronous text to that week's synchronous time. So every week I would have a slightly different design for it. And actually they really found that useful for keeping track of what was what and when they were looking back on things. So I would always post the in-person slides to Canvas ahead of time so they could follow along. I would share my screen, but just in case of technical difficulties, um, they would have that ability to do that work. And then they uh, were really engaged with me in, in putting what we had seen and putting what I had lectured or putting what they had read in practice together in that class time. So it really required me as an instructor to think about my sometimes two different goals um, for a class. Sometimes I had specific content I wanted to get across every week, I would say. I had a mix of content I wanted to deliver and a chance to see and assess and evaluate and work with my students in putting it uh, in person. For that in-class time, we did a range of whole group work and um, breakout group work. Uh, one of the other structures that I highly recommend is to consider using set breakout groups that students can get to know over the course of the semester. Um, they got to know one another a little bit through that way. They got to know each other's routines. They set up their own rituals about who shared their screen or who did this or that. Um, and they were really able to then use the time to engage with one another as learners, as um, Loretta and Laura both spoke to, kind of getting to know one another, but also um, it sped up the process a little. It wasn't as much dead time. It wasn't as much who's got this, who's got that. Um, we kind of knew. There was one student in my class who her screen would never share. We never could figure out why Zoom refused to allow her to share her screen, but it just meant we didn't have to deal with that. We didn't have to problem solve that every week. We just knew that somebody else would be the screen sharer for her group. Um, and then she was able to use it. My other kind of technical tool that was really great is because my student teachers were often engaging in the work and imagining um, how to use it or what they might do in settings and extending it beyond, um, I always would set up a Google Doc that was linked in our Canvas site that was live. So after each small group did their work, they copied it and, and put it in the Google Doc. And so they were kind of a building library and we used the same document for the whole course. So over the, the, the semester, they were building this living uh, resource for one another and to one another. And then I would go through occasionally and add like a table of contents to it. So it was a little easier to navigate, but really it was um, a really nice way to um, easily make things accessible, accessible across um, the small groups and across the content areas. So for me, I think my main tips for what worked in a fully remote space was, again, thinking about what served the best purposes for my intention. Was it a pre-recorded video? Um, Panopto is great. It's fully engaged in um, you know, with Canvas. So I would record it on my iPad, like I said, upload it to Panopto, and then there it was on Canvas. And my students said the quality was really quite good um, in that way. So I think using that was really helpful. Um, being really clear about how and when to use the chat function, which was a combination of more low key um, side comments, but also a place to ask questions. Um, was also a really valuable tool. But I think keeping those um, breakout groups really consistent across the semester, being very clear about how the material they had done ahead of time linked in. I often had several slides I would reshow in class to say, hey, remember this, you saw this in the video I sent out, here we go again. Um, and again, I know it sounds like a silly little thing, but having a slightly different visual for each week really helped my students. And the last comment I'll make is, I think right now we are all inundated with so many tools and, and thinking today about my trouble using Excel events as opposed to Zoom or Microsoft Teams or whatever the tools are that we're using, Flipgrid, Pear Deck, there are so many. Finding a few that really suit you and suit your needs and using those consistently and persistently over the semester 
my students were very open about how much they appreciated that, that if I was trying something new every week, um, they were quick to remind me that they are in multiple classes. All of us are doing this slightly differently. For my students, they were also teaching in different contexts. So I think that idea of creating structures and routines and rituals in the same way we would in our classroom um, really benefited my students' sense of comfort. And I also think sense of belonging in that class. It created some class norms um, that were necessary. And the last thing I'll end with, since my own audio didn't work and I'm clearly presenting from a car for various family reasons, is um, to eye on the prize, right? Having students engaged, having students present, having students be there was more important to me than anything. And um, without lowering the rigor of the work, but it really had me really thinking hard about what are my expectations, my needs, um, one of my students, his partner worked nights and they live in a studio apartment. So sort of how how did he need to interact through the chat in different ways um, for the family and life and just really leaning into that and leaning into a problem solving stance with my students. So if there was a concern, if there was an issue, if one of my students just really had terrible Internet connection at her house, I tried to create an environment where they would come to me with those problems so that we could then professionally solve them um, while still holding each other accountable to relatively high standards of engagement. Great, Katrina, thank you so much. Uh, thank all of you, those were great presentations. Um, I just wanna remind uh, all the participants that we are taking questions in the chat function. Um, we've got a few to start with, but please feel free to go ahead and type in there as we go along. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can with the time we have remaining. Um, we've left a good chunk of time for that engagement, so don't hesitate. Um, so first thing up, I'm going to come back to Laura, actually. Um, one of the participants was asking to see the rubric slide. Um, and we want to give that a try. The, there was a little um, trouble with the slides. I know they came up and we were seeing them and then all of a sudden they disappeared. We're not sure why. But um, let's see if you can maybe share that again and, and see if that will show. Yes. Also thinking maybe, yeah, I'll share my screen and then I can also try sharing a file as well. It looks like that's an option. So maybe at some point I can try that. Are you guys seeing my slides now? We are. Cool. Okay. So here's the rubric slide. Um, it's honestly pretty simple. Um, it sets out the expectations for exceptional. Um, really, I had a student that I met with last week and she said that she just looked at the what, what the criteria was for exceptional and made a sort of um, shell outline and then just put all of her ideas into that outline she made and it, it worked out really well. Um, similarly, I had a student who was completely unprepared um, once, which doesn't usually happen, but you know, sometimes. Um, and thus, you know, something like the, the limited uh, sticks was very easy to justify because the student didn't have any sort of PowerPoint or uh, prepared discussion questions. It was a lot of um, rambling and trying to talk, you know, in that moment. Um, so in that case, it was very easy to to justify a grade and the student was just basically said, yeah, I understand, I messed up. Great, thank you. Um, two yeah. things I would say, number one, just from the um, teaching center's point of view, we love rubrics. The research shows how valuable they are and we would be happy to help any faculty with developing those. And the second thing is um, we hope to have Laura's slides available on the Teaching Center webpage after the presentations. That's happening with many of the panel discussions. So I just want to make you aware of that. So thank you, Laura, for that. Um, no moving on, this is one that uh, several of you might want to jump in on. Um, do you have success with having students do the self-reflection on their learning? How is that working for you? 
Yeah, um, I would say for that one, um, I assume you can hear me now. <laughs> um, I, thank you, John. <laughs> I would say for that one, um, I chose not to use the um, OMET evaluation midterm, but I did do a mid semester check in and I am so, so grateful that I did. Um, but in that, I did have the students both assess what was working for me from from my perspective, what I was giving them and providing them, what changes they might need. Um, but I also did ask them at that point to do more of a holistic self reflection on am I giving to this class what I need? Am I doing my reading? What I found really valuable there was a few a little checklist. Like I am routinely getting my reading done ahead of time, watching the video carefully before class. Um, and it was anonymous, but it it helped me also see what was happening and what wasn't in, in their lives and, and help them um, fix it. And so I think like Laura said, it was much more of a formative assessment in the sense of, so then I could reach out and say, hey, I see a lot of you are saying, you know, you're you're doing the video, but you're not doing the reading. Here's why they're really important. But I ended up saying to them, if you're really running low, these are the weeks I want you to prepare on or things like that. Um, so I found doing that in the mid semester, I saw a, an increase in improvement in overall um, connection to the things that I was holding as really critical and central. Like Laura, I always make my rubrics and evaluations um, visible and available to them ahead of time. I actually use the Canvas uh, rubric creation tool. It's more time consuming than I wish it was to make the rubrics, um, but I do like then that it's all embedded in the speed grader and the other things. So it's one of those things like many of you needing to move everything to Canvas um, was a little bit of a shock culture for me this summer. But um, I do like those tools. And in relation to self-reflection, there's also a peer review evaluation that I've used multiple times where it will um, randomly assign or you can assign peers to evaluate each other's work. And they all really liked that tool because, again, it was one stop shopping. So when I was having them revise, they could go in, they could see each of their peers comments on their work um, and then they could do it. So in terms of self evaluation, I do really recommend that pause and think um, at the midterm. Um, and it also helped me kind of give an overview, a little mini lesson on study skills and scheduling, um, which I think was important. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Loretta or Laura, did you want to add anything at this point? Well, um, I'll jump in. So I, I do the self reflections also by assignment. Uh, and that helps a lot uh, with the students uh, to see how, because uh, we, uh, as Katrina, I work in a teacher preparation program. So I have many students that are teacher or future teachers. So I have undergrads that would like to enter the school of education or be prof of, or be teachers and so uh, this help also the student to understand how and wh what works and what doesn't work in the uh, during the program so for the rubrics for example i put more a rubric in which i uh, i actually grade their self reflections but the grading is in you, did you write in correct english did you uh, like were on topic so I evaluate different aspects, not the content. The content is completely free so that they can express really what what worked and what didn't work for them and how they felt about that. So for me, it's a very, very useful uh, tool uh, for the group, but also for the assignment to understand how it's working. Excellent, I think that's great. Um, the research on self-reflection and peer review is very strong and shows that those really increase the educational outcomes. And it's a great way for building community is what we find. And you really can't over communicate during this flex at pit time. And this is a way for students to communicate with you and with each other as well. So those are, those are terrific. Um, next one up, uh, are any of you instructing first year students? Because they, they tend to, have a particular issue um, in this new environment. I'm happy to take that. Um, 
least for now. Um, I have a lot of first year students teaching for the GSWS program because the uh, at least the intro course is a 100 level and a lot of students because of what's going on in our world are just interested to take the class. Uh, it also counts for the diversity credit and the W credit. So gets a lot of first years. Um, one of the ways that I work to make them more comfortable with that format is in the beginning of the semester, I tend to do a little bit more lecturing, but I don't just lecture at them the whole time. I'll include um, spots where I pause and ask them a discussion question related to what I'm talking about, or I'll ask things like, I'll put up an image and ask them what kinds of things they see in the image and what those might mean to them. And so getting them talking in a way that doesn't feel as intimidating or like they're completely responsible for it, um, and that I'm giving them things that they can kind of go off of. I also like to use the breakout rooms like Loretta um, and give them a structured discussion question that they then have to report back on. Um, so they don't just go in and say, talk to each other and, and report back, um, but answer this like very specific discussion question. And then we, when we come back as a group, um, have one or two uh, appointed spokespeople to, to talk to the class. Um, Great, I'll add, um, I teach mostly graduate students, although it is a one-year program and it's the first time they're in professional schooling, but my husband is actually a professor in the engineering school. Um, and we spend a lot of time talking about teaching and a lot of time talking about best practices across very different areas. Um, and one of the things that he has found really works with the this is he has a very particular tool where the students are required for credit to post a question based on the lecture notes that he gives ahead of time. And then he actually puts them in a website um, where they vote and the top three that get voted on, he starts by explaining in more detail in the classroom setting and prepares a problem around those. So that's been a way that he has really bridged that gap in the flipped classroom model. The other thing he does for those of you who might not be in the humanities, but are in more of the sciences, is he comes up with real world problems um, and then asks the students in breakout groups just to figure out what does this connect to that we're learning. So since he's teaching very theoretical or foundational science aspects of mechanical engineering, but they're thinking, like, what does this have to do with what I want to do? He's really trying to make those connections and get them to feel safe speculating, wondering, creating together. Um, so just if any of you are in the sciences, those are some tools that he has used that he has found incredibly powerful um, for those larger, more science, technical based courses. Excellent. He's um, he's doing some great things there. Um, I'll just mention that uh, I also teach in the STEM areas. Uh, I teach in the physics and astronomy department, and I frequently have first year students, and I also have large enrollment classes. So it's it's typical for me to have 100 students in a class. And the kinds of things that, that your husband is doing, the variation on the muddiest point, we call it, is a terrific way um, to engage them and help them with that. And the other uh, piece that sort of, um, tying it to what I call headline science. What's going on in the real world? Let's make a connection uh, is a great way to pull them in. So um, two thumbs up to him for that. <laughs> Thank you for mentioning those things. Um, he's he's sitting here with me, so we he, I will tell him that, John. <laughs> great, well, thank you. Um, the other thing I will mention is that on the uh, Teaching Center's webpage, there is actually a toolkit for students around FlexiPit. And you know you probably are aware all the participants of uh, what we've got for faculty to look at, but you might want to take a look at the resources that are there in terms of uh, what you can share with your students um, to be able to help them in the process. Great. Um, next question up is for Loretta. Um, do you have multiple group assignments so that all students could experience the different roles, basically rotating through group leader, note taker, et cetera? So I have multiple assignments. The one that I described in my presentation was the big 
final assignment in which we work through the whole semester. But yes, I have different assignments. So you can do in, in the classroom, for example, I used to love to do like museum walks and have them rotate around posters and write their own comments. And this was very difficult to organize uh, in uh, uh, online, but having using the breakout rooms as places in which they can rotate and have different roles really worked. This in the big, in the small assignment and in the bigger assignment as well. So I think, I think that this can be, uh, this, uh, roles can be really helpful. Also for, for example, even the first year students, when you have first year students to get used to how to do this, I always think of, uh, international students because when I came here for my PhD, I was an international student and in Italy, the, the school system is completely different from what is here. So you have to learn how the American universities work in order to be able to participate. So it's very important, uh, you know, that the students understand how they have to interact, when it's convenient or not convenient to talk, you know, depending if you come from a, a, a Western culture compared to an Eastern culture. So it's, it's really different. Each, each country has their own way of uh, schooling and, and that's very important in the classroom. So uh, I would say yes. Like uh, in, 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 in small assignments, you may have them do one role, but then as Katrina said, if you are consistent with the model, then they, they know how to interact. It's, it's just incredible, but you have to be consistent with the model. Yes, absolutely. That's great. What you were really both talking about is what we would call um, a, a sort of a subsection of guided inquiry. And the rotating the roles in guided inquiry is very powerful um, for sometimes things you don't think about, like the, the student who doesn't want to speak to everyone right in front of the, the class gets to be the reporter, for example, and they see other students do it and then they get their turn. So those kinds of rotating the roles really helps. They get to see what their peers are doing and it kind of builds up the confidence and gets them to participate. So great stuff. Okay, I'm just going to ask uh, participants if there are any more questions. I think we've come to the bottom of the list of those that have been posted. We do have a few more minutes if anybody else would like to share. And um, while I'm waiting to see if anybody types, I'll just ask uh, also our panelists whether or not there are any other sort of closing points you'd like to make. Um. I think my closing point that I'd like to meet more than ever, we've never done this before. So what Loretta is saying about international students who aren't used to US schools, none of us are used to this, right? It is a, a challenge. And I think because of that, the clearer you can be, um, you know, Laura's rubric or, you know, the more you can be organized, the more you can be clear. Um, very explicit in my syllabus about attendance, meaning the video and coming to the Zoom call. Very clear about what would happen if you had a technical difficulty in the same way that I would have had in my syllabus about illnesses or missing classes. I was trying to think ahead to what are these new structures and what are my expectations so I'm not repairing damage afterwards. So I think the more um, that you try to think through what of these models am I using and what am I going to do if something doesn't go well? But that also is for me. I was very open to getting feedback on what wasn't working. So, for example, I had the syllabus uploaded on Canvas, but then I wasn't reiterating what was due each week in the module where they were using every week and they were getting lost between those two. And it was one of my students saying to me, I didn't do the reading this week because I, I was looking at the module and it had the video and I forgot that there was somewhere else. And I used that and then I went through and just added um, each week's assignments to the module. So having that explicit expectations paired with an explicit request for help and support um, and just really making, I, it's good teaching in general, but I think right now more than ever, the more we can be incredibly explicit with our expectations, with the norms, you know, um, the better we serve our students and the more, um, the more comfortable they are with 
with having to do it this way, which which feels like a loss to many of them. So true. Um, I'll just add one other thing that I thought of while we were talking about breakout rooms and first year students in particular. Uh, with my intro classes, I always tell students that when they're in the breakout rooms, I'm not going to come in unless they give me a hand that says, help me and we have a question. Because I want to create that space for them where it feels safe that I'm not going to all of a sudden come drop in and listen in on their conversation. Um, I also, you know, I'm happy if they're having conversations that maybe aren't related to the discussion question that they were assigned, but they're still doing that work because I want them to be able to get to know each other and, and get more comfortable with the classroom space. So I think being clear to your students about whether or not you're going to drop in or not drop in or what the conditions of that are um, have been really important for me. Very true. Well, my my uh, final remark regards, you know, the fact that, as all of us have said, like to have the students interact and talk because this feeling of isolation of being alone is real, particularly if you are away from home and you're in the first year of your program and you cannot see anybody that that. That is a really tough situation for many students. So being also flexible and seeing if you cannot do one assignment that you had planned, just talk to them and 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 and, and, and being flexible in the in the syllabus too. Like yes, we did we give clear directions, we give clear uh, assignments, but also we are able to say, hey, we are not able to arrive to this assignment, so we are not going to do it. So ask for them flexibility, but ask for us also flexibility. I think it's an important thing. And then the second thing is like really use their feedback. And uh, I, I, for example, I've never asked, answered so many emails in my life as this year, but I, I really appreciated the fact that the students really wanted to connect with me. And, uh, uh, and, and it was also, I felt better because I miss my students, I miss seeing them. <laughs> so having also the possibility just to communicate with them, even if it's an, a, in an email, even if it's three words, I, for me was really valuable this year, so. Thank you so much. I just wanna take a second to, to thank all three of you, uh, Dr. Fernandez, Dr. Stam, actually all four of you and the doctors Jacobs um, <laughs> for sharing all of your uh, insights, which is <laughs> really terrific uh, and extremely helpful. Um, and thank you for giving your time because I know this isn't easy. And the last note I want to say to all of our participants, thank you for joining us. But I want to echo what our speakers have said, which is that we are still in a crisis. This is new for all of us. We're all, all still heard us say many times at the teaching center um give your your students a break and be supportive of your students but also give yourself a break right teaching is an iterative process we're all learning as we're going along you try to make the changes that you can implement some of these suggestions and keep working at it because we know we'll be using these online things again in the future the world has changed right so thank you for joining us thank you again panelists and you all take care <laughs>